Hey everybody, welcome back to Tom Girl, where we talk all things sports, entertainment, fashion, and adventure. And tonight, we got a great one for you. We have best-selling author, TV host, and CEO of Passion to Paycheck, Erica De La Cruz. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. You got it. All right, Girl, you yeah. It. Welcome, you made it. Welcome Thank you so Tom much. Girl. I know. I braved the traffic in the finest city in the world, and I'm and I've arrived. How are you? I know. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank I'm, you for having me. Of course. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I know. LA always gets us all sometimes. Oh, great. So thank oh. you guys for bearing with us. We're, we have so many great things to tell you about with this episode. So, Yay. So we'll just get right to it. Yeah, sounds amazing. I want to first, I think, start out with kind of your journey before, and then lead up to where everything wonderful that you're doing now, because I watched your Sue Talk today, which for those of you who don't know Sue Talks, no. they're like TED Talks. <laughs> Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you did? It's, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I no. want to talk about, yeah, your journey and kind of the adversity you got through to yeah. move on. No, fantastic. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. The minute that I hear um, someone has seen my Sue Talk or experienced my chapter in the book, I know they have a vast knowledge <laughs> of information. <laughs> like, they have a, have a good little chunk of info about my life, which is mm -hmm. cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit untraditional and... Um, I mean, I guess I'll start with, I'm, I'm, I do a lot of things now and, um, you know, there's praise and sometimes there's like, you got so lucky and it's funny to hear. And I know that it's the peeve of a lot of overachievers is that, that phrase or like, yeah. oh my God, you're so lucky to be doing that, which you are lucky, but there's a lot that kind of, um, I guess precedes doing all of it. So a lot uh, of hard work and a lot of effort, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of, you know, it's weird because idea generation is sometimes downplayed, but sometimes to generate the ideas that evolve, you have to go through things um, that lead to that evolution. And so I think that's what my Sue talk is mainly based on. And for those, you know, out there wondering what that is, um, the Sue talk was a real sort of recap of what my family went through in the um, recession mm -hmm. of, of 2009 that we don't really talk about too much. I mean, we, we learned about the Great Depression. Sometimes we mentioned there was an economy crash around 2008, 2009. But I don't know if we've really dug into the repercussions in terms of what happened. Um, what is that movie, The Big the big oh, Short? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was about to say The Big Sick. <laughs> so God bless Brad Pitt and Christian Bale. I freaking love them to death. But the film was all about what happened with the stock market, who got rich from it, and... I think maybe there were five minutes where it was ironically in the film they go to Northern California and they see this home being foreclosed in the movie because of the recession that was about to hit mm -hmm. and I, I remember having to almost leave the theater because of how short it was and just and I'm like oh where's the movie on <laughs> on just that because essentially that's what happened to my family in the crash, mm -hmm. which um, was we lost our business of 30 years, and our home was foreclosed in a really weird, almost unwritable way, where we had 11 hours to sort of pack up everything I've ever owned, and I lived in the same house for so many years that it was my lifespan, and then my mother, um, my mom just, you know, as we have parents who are also out in the world doing things, they're proud of those things. While she was proud of her children, she was super proud of that house. Mm -hmm. So I think she was in denial that it would ever be foreclosed. And like, she got, I remember she got the mayor of our town involved, but it was my first year in college. I didn't know a lot about what was going on. And so when I returned, I, I sort of was told, you know, your parents don't have a business anymore. It seemed like it was overnight. You don't have a house anymore. We're going to give you some hours to to pack up your house tomorrow, bye. So I'm <laughs> like, what? And, you know, staying with family, friends, thank God, because I couldn't get into my house was helpful, but um, it was a weird, weird experience packing up that day and kind of knowing life wouldn't be the same. And the other thing that happens in recessions is that your family, well, not your family, I should say humans, because we're all hum mm -hmm. human beings is you go through emotions and drastic changes lead to drastic emotional changes as well. And uh, my father, who, whose sole like purpose it seemed in life was to run that business, you know, when that crashes, he, he developed just hardcore depression. And so the, I mean, to put it into perspective, 
when I left for college a year earlier, parents were together in a Beamer dropping me off. Um, we were pretty well off, substantially, specifically because we were from a really small town. And, um, you know, a year later, my parents really weren't even in communication because you underestimate the power of a cell phone. And when you don't have a cell phone and when you can't pay that bill, yeah. all of a sudden, it's like, where do you send the carrier pigeon? There's not even an address. <laughs> and so it, it went a really weird direction that summer in my life, kind of went flip. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was an interesting time uh, for sure. I mean, my whole life changed. And I guess in that moment I was tested as a 19 year old, you know, a lot of people have to wait until like till they're well into their forties to figure out the sort of crises of pile up. And I think that I'm super thankful that the universe dealt me that hand and even to my family at the time who went through what they had to go through because all of a sudden it prevented it pro, or pardon provided me with this um forced environment of like a pressure cooker mm -hmm. and I got to see what kind of popcorn I'd pop you know <laughs> uh -huh. that yeah that's what happened um it was weird <laughs> and, and how did that push you to then then pursue like the entertainment after well, that yes for your career yes it was a, a, a thousand percent it was weird before then I always knew that I wanted to get into entertainment and I like had an inkling for it but I but the drive or necessity to do it it was nowhere it was um you know pressure creates diamonds type thing I think after that happened, I realized I don't have anything left to lose. Like, mm -hmm. it's weird because some people fight or flight would be like, oh, I don't have anything left to live for. And I think what I realized, pardon me, <clears throat> was that I didn't have anything left to lose. So the risk tolerance went up and I was able to sort of take these higher caliber risks going back to college and... Um, and, you know, I, I stated in my book, probably not as openly in the Sioux talk, but um, my family continued on their path. So my mother became, um, you know, homeless voluntarily in, inside of that community where she still is now, which I'm fin finally, I mean, a person has to take, it takes a while to be comfortable talking about those things. But then my dad bounced back eventually. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that when I went back to college, these risks were there to take. So I just sort of started applying for scholarships, getting into as many serving positions as possible, like serving tables. I, I don't know, four, four or five jobs later um, and a few grants and scholarships later, I was able to just fund myself, realize that the state was paying for my housing and I could take as many free internships as I wanted, mm -hmm. which ironically, those are a lot of the opportunities in the industry that get you to where you want to go. So, yeah. So it, it was it was so nuts, and it all culminated into me graduating, and becoming the first ever uh, youngest, essentially the youngest female marketing director at Entercom Broadcasting. So I was corporate for a while, but I don't think that opportunity would have come without my this weird like work ethic I developed. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything. I mean, I had no money. I had nothing. I had nothing. The other, um, we never got our stuff back. So when I, so when we packed up our home, a few months later, they didn't know who to get a hold of to pay the storage units. And eventually, we have fun watching things like Storage Wars, but people don't realize, like, there's families whose items you're, like, bidding on. And so, essentially, that's what happened to my family. Mm -hmm. And um, all of my items were basically gone. A family friend uh, went back and was secretly... This is so crazy. You can't write this stuff, but secretly buying the items back and eventually told me. Um, and so I did see some of those things, but I literally went back to school with what I had in my car to this day. That's mm -hmm. what I still have, apart from some of the things she was able to buy back. And so... And one of those things was your grandma's urn, urn. which your grandma was really close to you. And she, I thought that was such a sweet. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Thank you. I actually forget yeah. what's in that talk versus the chapter in the book. And yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's something I don't want. It's a little morbid, so I don't bring it up. Yeah. Sometimes publicly, unless unless the situation is there. But yes, it's one of the items that was sold. And I think it's such an important. It's so important for people to understand what this recession actually caused, which mm -hmm. was a lot of like a lot of crazy loss and transition abruptly for so many families out there. Like they took so much 
this isn't an exaggeration. People are mm. like, oh, she probably got to pick what she wanted to keep, and then what she didn't want was sold to the state and then repurposed at swap meets and flea markets. But no, I saw the stuff and then would never see it again with the exception of Facebook messages throughout college of people randomly going to flea markets and they'd see my picture in a frame oh. or something mm -hmm. and it would be like, is this, what's going, <laughs> does your family run this lot? What's going on? I don't understand. Yeah. And, you know, or um, I'll never forget, I got a message that was like, hey, these these carvings on your uh, on this kitchen table, I swear to God, they're ours from growing up. I think this is your table. And it's like at a flea market somewhere in the damn state of California. Yeah. So there was a little bit of that. And uh, with that, the the person going back to buy all of my things, who was my nanny from growing up, she's like my world. Uh, the book later would be dedicated to her and is mm -hmm. she eventually, like you just mentioned, found uh, a marble jar for three dollars at uh, a flea market. And, you know, asked asked what they wanted for it. And they said, oh, how much is the marble jar? And they said three ninety nine. And she knew exactly what it was. And it wasn't a marble jar. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're ever out there wondering, did I sell that? It was my grandmother's urn. So it was her remains. And I'll never forget the. Essentially, that was the transition to her saying, oh, I need to tell Erica that I'm buying all this stuff back. Because for a while, she had said that she was keeping it from our old house because I would go visit her. She created yeah. this room for me near my hometown so I could go back like the other kids for summers. And then she was like, how do I explain? I don't know how I'm going to explain this one to her. And then, and it was so surreal. Oh my gosh, I still, wow, it takes me back to that, to that minute. And yeah, I remember her telling me, you know, I have something for you. She was, it was on my birthday and I was so thankful. I don't know. It was just like, it was shock, but I really got to know what I was made of because every time I went into shock, I went into gratitude from the people who were there mm -hmm. instead of depression for who wasn't. And obviously, um, you know, eventually it was like an aunt would call me and be like, Hey, sweetie, just getting wind of what's happening. This isn't like a birth announcement or like, you know, an invitation to a party. I didn't call everyone and yeah. my, so my family, it. Mm -hmm. exactly. So it, it is weird to dissect how that happens, but you know, an aunt who really cared about me. It's like, Hey, sweetie, I think on college campuses, they have access to therapy. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, you know, whether you feel like this now or later, you should probably go. And it was just like, Whoa, I feel so supported. So it was like at having nothing, I realized I had everything that I that I'd ever need. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden that was the drive. I'm like, there are so many people out supporting me. I want to show them that like I'm on board. I wasn't into fighting the help. I was into like, I don't know. I'm like lovey by nature. I, I just loved them so much and was so blown away by them showing up that I'm like, all right. So I want to get these scholarships to show them I'm really mm -hmm. in it and I'm working and I'm going to like make them proud. Like they're believing in me. And to this day, it's weird, but my motivation and drive for little things like um, I'm on I'm on the junior board of a film festival right now, and someone's like, you know, is that why in your spare time would you want to just be on the board? And I'm like, honestly, there's a gala kicking off the festival each year, and I'd love to be able to bring my family, I call them, my family and the people who have supported mm -hmm. me to meet their favorite celebrities on occasion once a year, and that's the kind of access that's there. So. It's funny how much drive that actually gave me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would have had it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then how did that, that turn then into your, like, entertainment reporting? And what so, were kind of the steps of your career? Right. So the steps where I got this crazy, unheard of position um, as the marketing director. So if you're in corporate, a director is like a position that's usually waited on. And I was 23, got this marketing director job staff of 11 and a corner office and everyone's like you're not leaving but i knew no like I, I life is short you could lose everything tomorrow 
I knew I was leaving at a point. And so I stayed for about a year, a year and a half. But at the year point, I knew that I was sort of transitioning out. And um, what ended up happening is I, I was hosting a lot. I mean, I was entertainment reporting for a late night show. Uh, the full-time job was in broadcasting, so I was already sort of in the industry mm -hmm. and um, started hosting Fashion Week. And then what happened was, oh, my God, this is so crazy. <laughs> yeah, what happened was I was I left my full-time job. I was coming to Los Angeles. I worked with a few networks out here already. And I was scouted by Connected Women of Influence. They said, you know, we have these Sue Talks. You would be the first sort of millennial to give one, um, but we'd like to aim toward a younger demographic. And I showed up on day one because they, they put you through rehearsals so that it's a polished speech. And I gave this talk on business because I was used to people wanting to hear that I was the marketing director and, you know, a young female. And they said, no, 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 like this isn't what these talks are about. Mm -hmm. And I almost left the room because they said, we want to know about maybe the most vulnerable thing that's ever happened to you. And I'm like, why? So that's when I finally started speaking more publicly about what I had been through. And from the Sue Talk, this is the crazy part. From the Sue Talk, um, my now business partner uh, watched it, or maybe was in the audience that day. There was I, something. And he happened to have co published the Chicken Soup for the Entrepreneur Soul mm -hmm. books with Jack Canfield. And it was it was like the universe. He said, I watched your Sue talk. I know what you know you've been through. I see your social platform, so I know that you know you're into mainstream culture and the girl boss movement. And I want to put out something similar to the chicken soup series for young female mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Thus came Passionistas, uh, which was the book that I put out. Um, did extremely well on Amazon in 19 different categories, so it became a bestseller, and all of a sudden I was, like, the one heading it up and on the cover, and I'm like, huh? So it was really surreal. It was nuts. Tell people who maybe have not seen, read the book yet, and yeah. you all need to get it on Amazon, yes. about how you, because there's so many women in there with so many great stories, yeah. so how did you go about finding all those women and getting them to be yeah, vulnerable and share? Totally, so essentially what we wanted to do was he had, heard me share so vulnerably that I, and then I became passionate about it Huffington Post after that did a whole feature on my story and everything else and I realized like whoa vulnerable conversation is the access to everything I'm ever gonna want all the connection the real impact I started realizing that was the key and it wasn't all about what was on my social media platforms even though I a part of me enjoyed that the juice was in my vulnerable sharing so we decided you know with the publishers and the editors that they wanted to recruit you know 30 of the top producing female millennial entrepreneurs personal brands um it, it didn't matter what they were running so like some youtube channels products uh personal brands we have the ceo of we rule at the time um founder of the find guru like so many incredible mm -hmm. women but the prerequisites were each wrote a chapter, so it's a compilation book. If you are familiar with the chicken, chicken soup books, each chapter is a new story. And the prereqs were you cannot share anything that's readily available on your Instagram feeds. Hmm. We want to know what the real talk is. Like, we want to know what's actually happened, you know, whether that's a failure, a loss, something that you've been through. And so the book, it's called Passionistas, Tips, Tales, and Tweetables from Women Pursuing Their Dreams. Um, in fact, I should have a copy. My publicist is going to kill me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We've got to switch because I literally have one um, for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, so, yeah, anyway. So, so I was like, is it in here? No, or are you just, oh, no, no. I know. It's literally at home. Oh, and you I forgot my shirt. shirt. This, this is this the craziest yes, thing. Exactly. We'll so we have, we've got exchange. I'm sending it to I, you. Everybody, you can get her book on Amazon. You can also right away read it on Kindle because I was on the airport coming oh, back to the airplane this weekend. And I was just easy to Yay. instantly download it and start reading it. So There we go. <laughs> Amazon. Yes. Kindle. Uh, Barnes & Noble. It's on everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, so, yeah. So that was the... The real pivot. Now, what was your work involved in that? Did you go like research and find who you wanted to include? Did he help so, you out with that? How was yeah, so I think that he understood 
that I was immersed in this world of, um, like, you can't explain it, but when you're in the industry and you're on Instagram and you may be doing some celebrity type stuff, you know a few people already in your network who are up to big things. So I sort of started there and then I realized that there was so much interest, we actually opened up applications. And mm -hmm. instead of, you know, approaching people one on one or a Facebook right. post, I was able to say, you know, if you're truly interested in this, because often if someone takes the time to fill out that application, the commitment level is huge. Mm -hmm. And that that shown through in writing the chapters, in marketing the book. Essentially, we had 30 other powerful females marketing the book and getting the word out. So, of Such course, it was yeah. getting up the ranks. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah, so it was a large, large amount through application online. A lot of people I knew, I did, like, um, you know, shout the awareness on my social platforms. But then my business partner also decided to sort of post it a little bit more publicly. And then we realized the link was being shared beyond our world because I met so many women through the applications alone and um, yeah we sort of sat down I had a lot of personal calls with them so that was really important to me mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to them personally I wanted to know what they were about what they saw for their future and um, yeah they were sort of selected that way it's it's crazy what it's crazy what it's done one of the uh, co-authors she runs the LA girl um, it's the LA girl mm -hmm. everywhere like Google it she's right there mm -hmm. Oh my God, her partnerships are blowing me away. She has like Target and American Airlines. She's the face of all of it. And um, we just did my little bachelorette party last weekend. Congratulations. And thank you. <laughs> and it's funny because there she was sitting there and I started thinking I, had, I would have never met you if it weren't for yeah. my book. And it just served so many purposes. And all of a sudden it became almost like a stronger business card to, to bigger opportunities mm -hmm. that I was looking at that I never expected. Yeah. One thing I loved about the book, which being kind of in the in the, in the realm of you guys with the girl boss and the oh, you know, girl power oh my and God. stuff. Tom girl, but, I told you, the branding is like, you're a passionista. But yeah, but I'm like eating 100%. it up because I'm like, I'm ready to take things to the next level. And it, it was fun for me because opening that book, like there was yeah. a lot of people like the LA girl and other people that I do follow totally. on Instagram, but I had never heard their stories. They're amazing. So it was just so motivating too, to be like, yeah. to read about those people who have had their adversity as well. It's and incredible. when they push through, yeah. So it's such a motivating power. Yeah. Yeah, thank book. you for saying that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think if you're getting into any industry, like you are going to grow together. It's so incredible. I see these, my peers from a few years ago now, oh my God, they're, the expansion is huge. So the book is just another indicator. I, I'm watching these co-authors. Um, you know, at the time, I think one of them was at the rap Hollywood and she's now at deadline and <laughs> is like coaching the people at Rolling Stone. And I'm like, Whoa, people are just expanding and when you do it together, you get the juice you get the yeah. juju spilled on you and mm -hmm. it's like, oh okay. Like shared energy almost. So I just oh my god, it's appreciated ten times over. So yeah, the collaboration was was huge. I loved mm -hmm. I was excited. <laughs> yeah. Now you've now tra transitioned this yeah. into passion to paycheck. Yes. So talk to us about that. So okay, <laughs> so here's the scoop. So the book came out and simultaneously I was also on, I was, I think, with the CW, A-List Communication, and a few different networks at the time um, doing the TV portion of my world. I love it. I need it. I breathe it. The talk Meaning show. Meaning you're hosting and yeah. doing your show. Like, mm -hmm. doing my show, being in entertainment, um, it's just such a passion that that was being developed on the side of the book stuff where I was speaking so often. And mind you, they did overlap. Hollywood loves that I have a book. The entrepreneurial world loves that I talk to celebrities. It's like it feeds the other. Yeah. And at the same token, um, from Passionista, as a large audience grew that wanted to know what else they could be involved in. So um, my business coach at the time and I, we developed like a boss babe blueprint. Um, pardon, that culminated in a boss babe boot camp. So I was teaching media and mindset um, brainstorm facilitation, which I was completely certified in after my marketing, um, my corporate job. Mm -hmm. So I turned that into an entire program. I was coaching one-on-one, -on -one, generating a lot of revenue. And it's weird because I was less happy than I've ever been in my life mm -hmm. and realized that the one-on-one -on -one coaching thing was never gonna be me. I think I'm such a one-to-many 
that's how I get energy. And I realized it was being drained from the smaller coaching, personal development mixed with like passionistas. And they were attracted to me because of my entertainment world. But what I did realize was at the end of each program, we did a live event for about 12 girls, like high end program who I was coaching loved the live event part. Mm -hmm. So then I pivoted and I said, what if I could do a live event that took place inside of both of my worlds? So Passion and Paycheck was born <laughs> and essentially it was personal brands, personal development and TV personalities. And each year the keynote speaker is a TV well-known personality. We had Liz uh, Hernandez with Access Hollywood the first year, Kelty Knight um, from the Lady Gang mm -hmm. on E! and Entertainment Tonight the second year. Um, we are going into our third year now, and it's really a conference based in, it's less informational, more transformational. And that vulnerable conversation, we're getting the people that you see on your Instagram feeds, that you see on TV, to open up about the things not on their Instagram feeds exactly like the book was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's just sort of all the worlds blending together. So it's exciting. This year, Bumble has jumped on as our presenting sponsor, uh -huh. and I'm just like, what? So <laughs> it's so crazy. It's like surreal in a way. Um, and yeah, and I get to finally have that overlap of consistency where I have my community and TV, and then I also want to give back and give transfer, uh, pardon, transformation and entrepreneurial advice to young women. It's all this mm -hmm. kind of clash of the titans, beautiful thing that's happened. So yeah. What and uh, people can get tickets to that, or yes, 100%. So, passionatepaycheck.com. Um, if you go visit, we were picked up by Focus TV Network last year, so we do have a year round talk show that is Passion to Paycheck. The annual show, um, pardon, the annual event is this spring, so April 27th. You can get tickets, passionatepaycheck.com. Um, get them now. So, the speaker lineup is about to be released, <laughs> and the price with that will 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 increase go. so so go now yeah go now <laughs> passionatepaycheck.com grab your tickets come and join us in the gorgeous gorgeous space of the ondas um is the venue heart of west hollywood tons of passionistas um bomb gift bag I, i'm like excited for my own little swag bag so yeah we'll see <laughs> what are some of what's some of the details that go be into putting creating a live event like this oh my god if you yeah oh man <laughs> is this is this liquor no. <laughs> just kidding some vodka under them. <laughs> honestly it's weird it's funny because like i one of my goals is just it's just to be so real about my career trajectory so that people don't think that just to stay in integrity with everything my brand has been Planning an event comes with so many moving parts, and I am more a visionary, less an integrator. So luckily, I work with a team of amazing people. There's a team of four who are such a support network inside of, you know, everyone has their little um, category or department, if you will. But planning an event is nothing that I ever thought I would sign up for, and yet the payoff of a beautiful, beautiful day in the company that is that is experienced all the cost is worth the reward in the end. Mm -hmm. And it comes with a lot of rejection and a lot of no's. Specifically, like, year three, there's different set of issues. But year one, people are like, who are you? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Nobody cares. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, I mean, it's trying. It's trying yeah. on the psyche and the body. And and it's interesting because the team component for Passion to Paycheck is so huge because, you know, you have five people who believe in it wholeheartedly you know it's just it's weird they've made it their world um now they're on board for the long haul mm -hmm. and that kind of keeps you going but then you have these gems so just because one person doesn't see you does not mean that the plethora of others won't and the biggest the biggest point of that is i figured maybe five to ten years in i could get someone who i had been watching since my radio days um, if you're not familiar with who Liz Hernandez is, mm -hmm. she was on Access Hollywood for, I don't know, 10 years forever, started in radio. Now, she launched her personal brand at our first event called Wordiful, left Access Hollywood, God bless her, um, love Access, and I know she did too, but she literally, after Passion to Paycheck, decided to dive headfirst into her passion her. to create her paycheck. Mm -hmm. And now it's a segment on the own network and she just uh, partnered with smart water. So she's now the face right. of that. And she believed she saw immediately, immediately. She goes, 
oh my God, what a great opportunity. You know, how can I access your audience and how can I share and how can I give back? And it's, oh man, it was such a light at the time. Liz, if you're out, I love you. It was so beautiful. Well, so. That's a great note. What are, how would you tell people out there watching you right now yeah, yeah. how to turn their passion into their paycheck? Well, one of the biggest things that I, and my, this is my field of, of experience, knowledge, and, and expertise is if you are trying to turn your passion into a paycheck, like immerse yourself inside of what entrepreneurship is. Um, like, it's funny because I think that passion and paycheck, we have such a community of artists who also don't live and die by the auditions, if that makes sense. They have created mm -hmm. a platform to have their own thing going on and to sustain that. And as you create that platform, get around like-minded individuals, go and don't be afraid to invest in yourself. I say that in integrity with me not being afraid to invest in myself early on when I got that business coach. I was so nervous. I was like, what's going on? But I knew I had to believe in myself to follow through this program that I wanted to enroll in. And I didn't think twice. And I'm not saying go take out a credit card. That was my path. Mm -hmm. But I literally, this is crazy, a little personal, but it was a large amount. And I was like, okay, what has to work for this to work? And what had to work was my belief in myself mm -hmm. and my commitment to crying in my closet every 10 sales calls, knowing that the 11th would be a yes. And I made that commitment and I paid the credit card amount off in, in, three, in the first three months wow. of already having right. paid him off. And it was, it's weird because I think the universe aligns with you when you agree to be aligned with your own commitments. And mm -hmm. it's like, you're a fake almost. If, if you wanna do something, you know it's for you and you think that any financial component is holding you back, you actually, the, there's a gap in the belief system, I, th I think, mm -hmm. and there's something that's out of integrity with that because you're not putting all your chips in the basket, if you will. Um, the other thing is relating to yourself as a commodity. Sometimes we start personal brands and we think we have passions, but to generate that paycheck, you have to start treating every facet of what you do online, what you're presenting to the world, your partnerships, as something that is monetizable inside of pitching yourself and you know gaining those partnerships and leveraging your social media one of the things that no one can hardly believe when i speak is these partnerships i had early early on and i'm talking you know in the influencer world i met 1300 followers pitching myself for fashion week to kia because i host fashion week here in southern california all of the other partnerships that i had could benefit them and it was my belief in myself that corresponded to that number, mm. not the number of followers that corresponded to the number that, that I pitched the contract for. And I got it. And it's like this belief in yourself is more than a cliche. It's an undertone that the universe can sense. And mm -hmm. the opportunities you're getting, look around. And depending on what they are, you can sort of gauge your commitment level to yourself, like through the ebbs. Because the flows are there. The ebbs, you've got to be like... I still know who I am, mm -hmm, you know? So you just said you pitched yourself, which I want to talk about that too. So yeah. what are some of the business steps you took that did se 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 sorry, separate you from the rest, like by taking those chances, like pitching yourself, oh, yeah. or what are some other things oh, that you did? Absolutely, I mean, pitching myself was a huge component because so many people wait till they hit that like mm -hmm. 10, 10K number on their social platforms, and I was like, I don't need that. I leveraged my partnerships really hard. Um, that benefited all parties. I was involved with Fashion Week at the time, another late night show, um, and also St. Jude. So St. Jude was a charitable organization I met in my broadcasting sphere uh, for country radio, but I was still mm. doing every single one of their galas on the red carpet. So essentially, I knew that I had those three big partnerships, and even though I might not be able to sustain the type of reach that you know, a client or company would want to see on my own, I leveraged my community by saying, these are the three people I partner, I partner with. This is how they could leverage their social platforms. And if I have Fashion Week tweeting out a photo of what I'm gonna wear for this mm. event, St. Jude already, already posting whatever footage we're, you know, putting on for the event, and I cover entertainment, which I could so easily weave in your brand to, then all of a sudden you have ad space, a social media spend, and, you know, a partnership with all these brands so i would go to them and say 
you know, do you want to fund this uh, video? Do you want to fund this segment on behalf of this organization in partnership with all of the rest? And all of a sudden, I didn't have to start small um, mm -hmm. inside of that. So leveraging the community, I feel like that was a big, that was a huge step in realization in the game was, who do you know that you can collaborate with to pitch the grand scale? And you don't have, you don't have to wait for that. Like, mm -hmm you know, okay it with your partners or whoever to, whoever else you know, but make sure it benefits all parties. And then the other component was this, I have always, if I was gonna ask people to coach with me, I wanted to be in integrity coaching with someone else. And the reason I can ask people, the reason I could ask people to enroll in my high-end program, which was not cheap, and the reason I could have, you know, 12 clients at a time was because I had already paid for that type of program. I'm in complete integrity with what I'm asking you to do because I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. So making sure that I'm always, even with passion to paycheck, there's always a transformational aspect. It's not just going to listen to successful people on a panel. There's vulnerable conversation. You're meeting these people on television, but there is a component that is so interactive and allows you to open up and evolve I need to make sure that I am evolving as well. So keeping yourself while turning that passion to a paycheck, enrolled in programs with coaches, with mentors, whatever it looks like to sustain whatever you're giving back, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. fueling yourself, then you're then you have nothing to hide. Like so many people are like, what if they find out I'm a phony, which is just a mind trap that doesn't actually yeah. exist. But to go the extra mile and actually be keeping what's between your ears, savvy with what you need to deliver is a huge component, I think, inside of it actually landing and mm -hmm. being successful, mm -hmm. I think. So. Were there any things that you learned that you're like, oh man, I wish I you know, knew that earlier on? I'm just, just, man, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I feel like one of the biggest things <laughs> was titles. I was so young that they're like, you're a director. I'm like, I'm a director, <laughs> but I was also on the air part-time for the radio stations. And I remember two years in asking someone I trusted, like, hey, do you think it's okay if I start calling myself um, an on-air personality? Because I am doing the shift during the week. And they're like, are you kidding me? Like, girl, no one, there's no timeline. No one's gonna write you or send you the email <laughs> that you can officially call yourself something. I realized that that held me back for a while. Pardon, was not claiming and naming what I was mm. doing. You know, so many people are like, I'm trying to become a, an actor. No, you're just an actor. Like that credential is mm -hmm. not coming for you. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of respects, the people who are up to things, you know, I'm a, I'm a struggling artist, whatever it is. I'm just an artist and I'm thriving in my life type thing. You don't have to sell a piece to call yourself what yeah. you are. Right? And it definitely changes your mentality oh, because I, I've been that person. And it's yes. like, it's, if you don't step into it, you're, you're not yeah. going to see the goals yes. that, that, that you want to achieve. Like, Love no, it. I could talk to you all day long. Love you. There's so much I want to pick <laughs> like, your brain for. I know we're just about out of time. Yay. Before we go, I want to do a speed round Ooh, yeah. real quick and Let's just ask it. you a couple questions. It's a little quiz about what kind of Tom girl you are. So, Ooh. so I would you Tom choose? Girl the brand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pick her brain on how she can make me grow this brand. Yeah, baby. <laughs> anyway, Come all right. Oh my God. You're coming to Passion That's, to Beijing. So for <laughs> everyone watching, Tom Girl will be there. Let's so figure this out. So you guys all in the house. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cold beer or spicy margarita? Mm, scotch. That's even better. <laughs> ocean or the mountains? Ocean. Favorite sports? Dance. Dancing? Beer pong, dancing. <laughs> I'm not very athletic. Those, are both, those both count. They count. Your best beauty hack? Um, pay someone else to do it. <laughs> Go to outfit. Um, leggings. Unless I'm on a carpet, then a gown. <laughs> um, your favorite motto or words of advice? Uh, you can never be overdressed or overeducated. And are you a passionista, fashionista, tom girl, or all of the above? Oh, I'm so all of the above. Yeah, Is that job. the right answer? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, baby. This was such a blast. All right, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank and you. good luck with everything. Tell everybody one more time where they yeah. can get tickets to Passion to Paycheck Absolutely. and how they can follow you. Totally. So passiontopaycheck.com. Follow along at Passion to Paycheck. And then my personal platforms are all at underscore Erica Delacruz. All right, yeah. guys, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again here. We'll see you here again next week. Bye-bye. Perfect.
Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.